We're here today with the Afghan Files whistleblower, David McBride, who is facing a lifetime in jail for doing the right thing by exposing war crimes by Australian troops in Afghanistan. David, thanks for agreeing to chat with us. Can you give us a bit of background to start off what you're actually facing in terms of your prosecution at the moment? Well, you rightly said I'm facing a possible lifetime imprisonment. There's actually an unlimited upper limit, so I could die in jail. I'm in my late 50s now. Um, even if they say, well, you could have got <clears throat> 200 years, we're only going to give you 20, that's obviously, um, it, it's, a big, you know, it's a big thing. It's something that I'm, I'm not complaining about, though, and I'm, I, I like to emphasise, I don't feel sorry for myself. This is something I've gone into with my eyes wide open. I believe it's an issue that needs to be sorted for Australia's future. Um, and I'm proud to stand up uh, what I believe. And if I've committed a crime, I'll, I'll go to jail. I'm all about the rule of law. So um, I'm not trying to get sympathy. I'm, uh, I'm trying to get justice. And your situation, in some respects, mirrors that of a number of Australians who have acted on principle and have come out and said, this is wrong in their various professions and have been persecuted for it. We have Witness K and Bernard Kaleri. We have, of course, Julian Assange, the most globally recognised uh, of this type of uh, prosecution. Uh, we have Richard Boyle, who took on the ATO. There are a number of Australians. How would your situation, do you think, differ from theirs? It's very similar, and there's more similarities and differences. And the key thing, this is why my case is so important, we need to work out whether it's okay, whether the government can say it's illegal to report government crime. Now, they have a bare majority, they can do that. Um, I believe if they can do that, there's no reason why they can't pass a law to say it's illegal to vote for anybody but us. I think that's wrong. I think it doesn't matter whether parliament has passed a law, legislation, if it fundamentally goes against the spirit of democracy, it cannot be law. I don't think you can ever make it illegal to report government wrongdoing. And that's what my case is all about. So can you tell us, just give us a, a background, a bit of a briefing on the timeline and what actually happened in terms of your involvement in the armed forces in Afghanistan and things that happened subsequently that mm. brought you to this position that's been going on for a decade? One of the, the similarities that I have with uh, the ATO whistleblower, Richard Boyle, and um, uh, Bernard Caleri, the, the cases that you mentioned, and in fact, um, uh, Jeff Morris, the Commonwealth Bank whistleblower, is that we were all actually uh, relatively conservative-minded people who believed in the rule of law and believed in doing our job. That's one of the the misconceptions that whistleblowers are sort of uh, are activists or bomb throwers, generally we're people that um, very much believe in doing the right thing. When we believe, we believe the propaganda that actually the, the government is good and the government follows the law. And when we see something wrong, um, we think that it's actually our job to speak up. I have a very um, sort of blue chip, background, I can't deny it. I, I'm from a wealthy family. I went to a good school in Sydney. Uh, I joined the British military first. Uh, I went to Sandhurst. I went to Oxford University. I was never, um, uh, like Julian Assange, I was never sort of against the Americans. I was never uh, against the British. I really believed in the rule of law. I did a tour of operations in Northern Ireland. I came back. I was a barrister in Sydney. And I joined, um, I, I found the law a little bit too, uh, it lacked the public service um, that I wanted. And uh, I, I rejoined the Australian Army at my wife's suggestion, but this time as a lawyer. Before I was just a soldier, but as a, as a lawyer. And I found it the perfect combination of what was important to me. I was half lawyer, half soldier, half defending the country, um, using my legal brain. I had a good career. I did... Um, two tours of Afghanistan, and, and not everybody gets selected to go to Afghanistan. I became increasingly concerned that we were uh, talking the talk and not walking the walk. We had a case in 2009 where we killed five children, and there was a trial, but the trial was axed before it got to court. And I think as a result of conservative pressure, 
I began to realize or, or suspect that polling and public uh, perception was really running the war in the sense that even if someone had murdered five children in this case, if, if it was you were going to lose votes by having a trial, there would be no trial. And that's been borne out in England. Um, and increasingly, it, the war was being run like a crooked real estate operation where we were putting out false information all the time. We made heroes of people who weren't heroes. We made villains of people that weren't villains. And that's one of the important things. While I'm known as the sort of war crimes whistleblower, it first started because I could see that good soldiers were being scapegoated for just doing their jobs because the political winds had changed and they needed scapegoats, so they found some scapegoats. It's a bit like the NRL analogy where some, some famous players get into trouble, but you don't want them to go down because the club is going to go down. So you find some 19-year-old new recruits and you make an example of them uh, because that won't affect the club's bank balance. Uh, and there was more and more of that going on. I think one of the best illustrations of what I was talking about happened in recently when the, the Afghan uh, nation that we built or the government we built collapsed in a heap days after the Americans left. And that showed what a lie it was. For, for 20 years, we said it was going well publicly. Everyone in the military knew it wasn't. And it showed that we were, we, we were pumping out things that had no relation to the truth. And that in itself is a crime. We were fooling the Australian public. We were lying to the Australian public, saying everything was going well. Our allies were often criminals, drug dealers, pedophiles. But uh, we pretended that they weren't uh, in order to sell a good news message. It was a bit like, um, and your viewers will understand this, it was a bit like the war was a, was a huge military enron in that we were putting out good news information, um, uh, uh, the things were going well, but it was, a, it was a house of cards, a Potemkin village, which was about to fall down. Um, I could see that in all sorts of levels. We were putting out PowerPoint to say, oh, look how well we're doing when it, when it had no ver bearing on the truth. We were showering medals on people who were murderers, and, and, and we knew that. And occasionally we'd make a scapegoat of someone who was just doing their job. So it was, it was a big problem. It was hard to get people interested because it just sounds too big. And you would have this as well. I mean, if you start to talk to someone about it, especially when I was a true believer, and I believe the whole stuff, I still do. I still do believe that democracy is good and uh, we, you know, we should be um, fighting for freedom. All of that stuff's good. It sounds good. But when you begin to see the seamy side of it, it's a bit like a police force which, is, which has become corrupted, you become quite revolted. And uh, it was hard to, to be taken seriously because people didn't want to believe that it was so rotten and at and such a high level uh, because you look like a conspiracy theorist and you look like you sort of hate on everything, but I don't. I, don't, I love the American people. I, uh, I think that, they, uh, I think that our, their government and our government have been hijacked by some of the most cynical people and they use patriotism, they use um, words like freedom and democracy in order to sell a product which is not, not the product that we're actually getting. But talking about the selling products, the, the opium trade obviously didn't stop, uh, so that was still a huge source of income and uh, the spectacular collapse uh, and, and you know the, the, the Taliban coming back after 20 years, I mean as you say, it evinced the, the failure of the nation building thing, but just on that opium trade thing, was it interrupted during the time or was it just allowed to continue? And I'm glad you mentioned it. Because has there been any change? This is one of the things which illustrates how topsy turvy our worldview was or, or the propaganda. I, I was privileged enough to go to Afghanistan in, in the year 2000 when the Taliban were running. Um, I traveled all around, we were making a travel documentary. And being a former soldier, even though they were, the, the Taliban were already demonised around the world, I had yeah. some sympathy for them. I knew that they were an amateur government and I knew that they were a product of uh, the civil war and the Russian um, and, and, and 20 years of terrible things. So 
Uh, the Taliban actually destroyed the heroin poppy uh, because they decided, uh, Mullah Omar decided it was un-Islamic and, and that people with addicts were bad, you know, Afghan addicts were dying. And he probably didn't think it was good for American kids to be dying either. So he, they actually destroyed it. Great, they were desperate for money. They had thousands of people dying of famine, but they still destroyed the poppy. And I know that because we drove around and we saw all the fields and 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 they were the sort of people... Um, if they said something, they did it, you know. They weren't like us. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, when we came back uh, from 2000, the terrible thing was we put in um, Hammond Karzai's uh, brother and family and, and they started growing it again. And because they were anti-Taliban or on our side, they were allowed to grow. And we, but we also had terrible wheels within wheels where, we killed a lot of poppy growers. I mean, we just killed them dead. Um, and that was, a, that was against international war. But the Americans just decided, as they do, with their, uh, with their very questionable interpretations of international war, to say, if you're growing poppy, you're going to give the money to the Taliban, therefore you're Taliban and we're just going to kill you. Uh, that's wrong. And that was actually murder. But the Australians were involved in a lot. This is one thing that hasn't come out yet. We were involved in what they called a lot of anti-Nexus operations where we just killed poppy growers uh, and it was illegal and nobody in within the Australian uh, rather had enough backbone to say, um, you know, are we sure we can just kill people for growing poppy? And, uh, and it's particularly ironic and, and disgusting to me because we, I did years and years of training both at law school in Oxford and, and in the military and I knew that that wasn't right. I knew that you couldn't kill people um, for being even involved in organised crime. You couldn't just make that connection to say, oh, well, you must be part of an insurgency. Not necessarily. And they don't, you can't just do the death threat. But they've got away with that. Um, and the poppies come back. And now the, and, and, and there is credible evidence that the CIA are involved in the growing of the poppy. So it's become... It's become sort of disgusting. We try to paint the Taliban as these evil people and there was a lot of propaganda that said they were behind the poppy and whatever. Actually, the opposite was true. For all their um, kind of medieval ideas, they didn't, they killed the poppy. They thought it was kind of evil. And when we came back, it was a, their toxic nationality that we were right and they were wrong meant that we, we grew poppy. Um, we used the money for ourselves. We... Uh, got allies who were openly pedophiles, uh, openly murderers. We would we would engage with anybody as long as they would be on our side. And and it, it made me, it still makes my skin crawl now as I'm saying it, it, particularly for someone who grew up as such an idealist, I began to see that we were the bad guys. You know, we were full of it. You know, we said the stars and stripes and we talked about democracy, but we were drug dealers. We were poppy growers. Well, we were, we were murderers. We did Abu Ghraib, which had no, uh, you know, no one high up got punished. We did, we, we, we cynically did um, Guantanamo Bay, you know, and they actually came, they said, oh, well, if we bring these prisoners back to America, they're going to have rights. Even if we hit them in Afghanistan, they're going to have some rights. But if we bring them to some place which has um, a questionable legal status, we can torture them. You know, uh, and, the, and the rendition was the same. We can't bring them back to America and torture them. We'll take them to Kazakhstan and we'll pay them, you know, a couple of million dollars so we can torture them in Kazakhstan. Uh, that's our allies. Um, that goes against all the training I had. Um, and I was repulsed by it. And the more I looked into it, I actually started it relatively small. And this is a point worth making as well, is that I didn't go straight to the media. I wrote a very uh, diplomatically worded 20-page document with, with 400 attachments. This was in what year? This was in 2014, after my 2013 um, deployment, um, where they threatened to arrest me because they said um, I, you know, I was obstructing justice. But I was actually standing up for some soldiers who were being made scapegoats. I said, you've got to apply. Simply, I just said, we have got to apply the law in investigating SAS people. By this stage in 2013, the winds had changed and they were looking for some SAS scapegoats, I believe. And they were trying to put some people on trial for murder 
who had simply um, just done their job and may have uh, uh, they may have shot one someone by mistake in the heat of battle, but they uh, they had not committed murder. But the, the the military brass was so cynical; they needed someone to go to jail, and they were looking. And I stood up for this guy and said, "No, um, I didn't say he was innocent. I said we just need to apply the law." Yep. And they tried to put me in jail for that, and that that made me think this is a strange. What thing. charge did they try to make? Stick Obstruction of justice. Of justice. And that was never going to work. I just laughed at that, a bit like you did with your defamation. I was like, how can a lawyer be guilty of obstruction of justice by giving a legal opinion? You know, I might be, you, know, you might have a different legal opinion, but if you don't want a lawyer to give a legal opinion, why do you send him to the battle space anyway? But I began to see the reality of the military structure. And it wasn't about, they have lawyers just for show. It wasn't really, a, they didn't expect me to follow the law and help SAS soldiers. They, they wanted me to follow orders. And if the politicians wanted a, a scalp, they wanted me to bring them a scalp. Um, and I didn't like that. And when I got back, I wrote a 20 page complaint, internal, not even a complaint, because I, you know, it, it's a very hierarchical structure and you lose your job for being rude to a senior officer. And they can actually, it's something called insubordination, which just means, having an attitude and put you in jail. So I couldn't have an attitude. I wrote this thing and I did it in my spare time and it took me months and months and months. Uh, and now even when I read it back, I'm quite impressed by it. I even saw the AFP. I contacted the AFP hotline and I said, I think there's something wrong in the Defence Force and that we don't follow our own laws and we do it, we do it deliberately. And um, it, if nothing else, it's a spending offence because you're only meant to spend money on legitimate goals of a department. That is fighting the war. Uh, but we were spending money on false uh, media messages, which is not fighting the war. And we were spending money on scapegoating people again, which is not fighting the war. And, and it was because they've worked out that if the, if the electorate likes the military, they will tend to re-elect the, um, the, the incumbent government. And so they were important. It was important for them, for the electorate to like the military. So they were spending money. It was a way to get around government, you know, election advertising. It was spending a lot of money on making the military likable, regardless of the facts. And uh, so I said, even, even if it's just on a pure spending uh, law, we need to have a look at this. So the, the, the AFP fought me off. They said, if the government does it, it can't be illegal, basically. And they said, anyway, um, you've got your own military police and if there's anything wrong, they will find out. I said, the military police work for the generals. You know, they can't, they're not gonna, they're not gonna investigate their own generals. So don't expect them to do anything. And they were like, yeah, well, sorry. They were quite good. I mean, they weren't, they weren't evil, but they were, they were just like, yeah, that's shit happening. That's a bad world we live in. You know, the government can do what they want. So anyway, I wrote this long internal complaint and I, I was trying to say, look, we need to follow the law. We can't just scapegoat people one day, uh, lionise people the next. We do, if, if there's, if there's an, an allegation of murder against a famous person, we have to look into it, you know. Uh, we've got carry, And I, at that time, I was still a true believer, and I was hoping they'd come back to me and say, with a deep breath, they'd say, look, you're right. We're fighting a war. We got carried away. And, yeah, we did start to, to run a bit fast and loose with things. So I was trying to say, draw the analogy to say, if if the military are allowed to continue in life and and murder for for political purposes, where's it going to end? You know, we're going to fucking go and kill the Labor Party guy and say it was a suicide. You know, there's no difference. There's no legal difference between doing those things. We can't mislead the Australian public, and we and it's all very well to say, oh, we'd never do that, but um, the military don't think that way. And, uh, if you say to them it's all right to kill people and lie about it, they're going to continue to do it until you tell them it's not. Um, and it was a worrying thing. So I tried to make this point uh, as diplomatically as I could. I still had a career at that stage. And um, although I was rapidly, that was going down the tubes because I was seen as a trouble, you know. Like people couldn't, I was surprised, and you might find this, I was surprised how many people ran for cover and couldn't believe that I wanted to make trouble. Even at this stage, it was just a relatively polite letter to saying, are you sure we don't want to uh, have a second look at this? And I was, at the time, I was prepared for them to say, yeah, yeah, I can see your point. 
Um, and I thought I might get a pat on the back and maybe, who knows, maybe even a promotion for doing what, taking that hard call. It happens in corporations too, precisely this yeah. slide is yeah. to, to be somebody being deemed to be not part of the team but to yeah. be a, a troublemaker. Of course, that can either they buckle under and put up with it or, but in your case, of course, you, you didn't. You continued to do what you thought was the right thing. Well, it took them a whole year to, to, to decide and they, and they eventually came back with it. As I expected, this is one of the frustrating things about being a military lawyer is that your, one of your bread and butter jobs is putting down <laughs> complaints. So I kind of knew how they were going to handle it, exactly the way I would have handled it, draw it out, write a very long response and say, you know, on balance, we've decided he's got no case, mm. which, of course, is what they did. But I still had to go through that motion. I knew I wouldn't get any sympathy if I went straight to the press, and I didn't really want to. I was still very much, I wanted to stay in the military. It was the perfect job for me, half lawyer, half soldier. So it was quite, it, it was a very hard time for me. I, I searched for what I was going to do. I did, um, in 2014, I spoke to Chris Masters. Uh, I chose, I didn't, well, it was a little bit of the universe. I didn't know his full history when I chose him. I knew he was a relatively conservative guy who wrote positive things about the military, who'd been to Afghanistan, who'd been with the SS. So I thought he would care. So I thought he'd say, look, we are scapegoating SAS people when they don't deserve to be. Uh, and I think that the reason we're doing that is to cover up some really serious crimes by, by famous people. He seemed to get it. Uh, and I wasn't, I, I'm not ashamed of speaking to him. I might go to jail for speaking to him, um, but I'm not ashamed of it. He was, it was a bit like the, the Watergate um, uh, affair in that it wasn't going to fix itself without uh, the media. I tried to ask the media, the, the military to fix themselves. They weren't going to do it. You went through the proper whistleblower channels. I went through the channels. And mm. actually under the Act, uh, the Public Interest Disclosure Act, uh, you are allowed to go to the media if you make a complaint and then um, the complaint is fobbed off. And I waited um, over a year and, and they fobbed it off eventually and said, you've got no grounds. Uh, and... Um, and then I started going to, um, to people like Masters, who are very responsible. And this is one of the annoying things. It's not like I went to the Chinese. I could have sold secrets. I had the, I had a top secret security clearance, um, access to a lot of things. It could have got me a lot of money if I wanted that way. I didn't want that. I um, I uh, I went to a very responsible journalist who I thought, like Bernstein and Woodward, could 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 really start asking more questions and um, get some action, which is what I really wanted. The problem with all this, it's not about, oh, uh, you know, me having a tantrum about it, 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 them not doing what I wanted. If, if the military is corrupt, if the military doesn't do what it says it's doing uh, and doesn't spend money the way it's meant to, Australia's not protected. And that bothered me. As a lifetime soldier, that bothered me to say, we're not even protecting the country. We're pretending to protect the country. But um, if, if this present government fought the Chinese, as they seem determined to do, they would consider it acceptable if Darwin was totally bombed by getting a green screen of Darwin, Dutton and standing there going, Darwin is safe. <laughs> Get some soldiers. That's how they fight wars, with phony, phony stuff. They don't really care about what happens. They don't care whether you... I don't think they cared whether, how many civilians got killed as long as no one found out. It was all about uh, public opinion. And that bothered me. That really bothered me, because not only was it wrong, it meant we weren't going to win any wars. Did you know, though, that um, what sort of apprehension did you have? What sort of feeling did you have that you're taking this next move uh, to release the information more broadly in the public interest, in the national interest, indeed, would end up, you must have known the risk of rolling the dice on this. Yeah, I did. And that's why I don't want sympathy. And But I was, it never occurred to me, I never had any fear. The journalists always said, they were, to be fair to them, they always said, you understand that you've been in the frame for this. And I can I understand. I guess that shows you the sort of disconnection between being a, an investigative journalist with, and they're brave people, they do a good job, and actually being a soldier. I mean, they... They didn't really want to go to jail for doing their job, which is fair enough. But they're it's exposed just, to career-wise, yeah, defamation-wise. Yeah, yeah, they, and I, I get that. But yeah. I was a soldier yeah. and I was 
the reality, it's not been melodramatic, but the reality of being a soldier is that you might have to die for your country. You can't, if you, if you don't like that, you shouldn't be a soldier. So I was, and I was so angry by what I saw as the absolute trashing of everything we were, we were meant to stand for, that I was like, bring it on. You know, I don't care about going to jail. I just want justice. It was a bit, I was a bit like Rambo in the sense that I was so angry about what we'd, what we'd become because um, even from the early days, I saw the Herald, they said, do you, you know, I said, look, I'll do a bloody public appearance in my uniform if necessary, if I think it's going to achieve something. Well, I don't want to self-destroy. The only reason I needed to sort of stay out of jail for as long as I could is I needed to win the case and I wasn't going to win the case of a jail cell. But I, I certainly was never afraid of that. And that's because I was, I was a true believer in Australia. I was a true believer in democracy. I was a true believer in America. And I was so angry when I saw that it was, we were increasingly becoming a nation of car salesmen and, and it's unfair to car salesmen, but, but the worst kind of con men. And I was angry. I wanted it fixed. And that conviction, the rule of law st stays today, doesn't it? Because you're not contesting that if they want to hold these trials, the David McBride trial in secret, in camera, you're not contesting that. You're saying, well, if that's the case, you've still got a reasonable um, uh, view of the judiciary and that they will come up and make the right decision in the case. Is that is that a correct? Yeah, that's the case. I wasn't even going to get lawyers to begin with. I, I'm satisfied. I've got. Uh, I've been treated very fairly by the AFP, uh, by the Crown prosecutors, and by all the the, the Canberra uh, judges and magistrates I've appeared before. I, I, I can't speak highly enough of them. They've been so good. I've got no fear of the judiciary, um, and I, uh, uh, if we have to have a secret trial, a judge alone trial, I'm, 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 I say that's fine. I, um, I, uh, I'm, I'm about I've, from the very beginning against all the legal advice I had. I spoke to the police. I said yes. I gave the documents over. Um, I don't want the case to be run about whether I gave the documents. I did. I did it because I was justified. I did it because I think that in in certain circumstances, like a Holocaust or whatever, you must be justified in speaking to the press. And, and it'll be a question of fact about whether the circumstances were bad enough, but I'm happy to have that issue ventilated and happy to have that issue judged. But you didn't pass on operational things. No, so there, there's no operational things at risk here. This was about historical things that had happened that yeah. had been, about breaking the law, basically. That, the government, and that's why, that's where I get angry. The, all the judicial people have been fantastic. The government, is not, the government has been totally disgusting in that regard, and they know there's no operational. Uh, what happened, you know, if someone murdered someone on a hill in Afghanistan uh, 10 years ago, that's not national security information. That's just a crime. And the idea that that would somehow endanger us to the Chinese, it's just, it's just disgusting BS. It's not national security information that a crime occurred and a child was murdered and it was covered up by a government official. That's a crime and people need to speak. And, and no matter, I, I will, they, could, they could execute me, but I will never say that it's okay for the government to stop people talking about murders of children by soldiers because the government say, you know, that's, that's wrong. Just another issue here in the aftermath of Afghanistan, since the withdrawal, of course, the people that are sticklers for we should have been there in the first place and our conduct was fine, they're, they're basically the people, the promoters of it, um, they're now saying that women are... Uh, uh, are endangered. Now, is that the case? Because this is the, obviously, you know, from the conservative side with Vietnam War, that we're not, the, the refusal to, to embrace the fact that it was a complete farce and that many people died unnecessarily, in that case, millions. And then Iraq, of course, uh, the propagandists, of course, continue to find justification. And it seems to me that the central justification is now that we were trying mm. to do the right thing for women, the Taliban are going to be bad for women. In fact, they haven't got a great track record on women and masking and generally. What, what is your view about the Taliban and women? You must have got a reasonable feel for it while you were there. Uh, that's all a crock. That, I mean, that, the only reason they even say that is because they know 
it's likable. When the progressive, one of the things I used to do um, a, as a military lawyer was uh, sign off on what they call information operations, psyops operations, which is false information we put out in order to win the war, whatever that may be. Of course, it's a bit like the murders and covering up. It's been abused. So um, it's like you might have seen in the Syrian war when fighting ISIS, there were things on social media about, here's pictures of ISIS of killing a gay person. They're throwing a gay person off the roof. And as someone who's been involved in those, I could, you can see that that's a, false, that's a fake photo. You know, ISIS may kill gay people, but that is not a photo, a real photo. It's, it's convenient to win the progressives over to the war, you know. We will make up stuff to win conserv- uh, win progressive votes or win conservative votes. Um, and well, indeed, yet- just to get just to get um, consent, yeah. national consent for the for the war. I know. And if you asked an Afghan girl um, uh, what they most want, they would say, "Not to be killed by an American bomb." Thank you very much. I mean, we we killed thousands and thousands and thousands of young girls with our fucking bombs. So it's just it, it's it's it, it's disgusting to hear George W. Bush say with his wife, "Oh, it's all about Afghan women and girls." He doesn't care about Afghan women and girls any more than he cares about Texan women and girls. He cares about saying something which will touch a chord. Um, we 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 killed so many Afghan women and girls, and we continue to. Um, and uh, there's no justification for starting a war because you're worried about the human rights. Um, that is, um, it's, a, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a whole new level of cynicism to show that we, were, we, were, we weren't in the war to help Afghan women's war. We were there for all sorts of reasons, mainly for revenge, mainly to win elections. We didn't care how many people we killed. Um, and uh, Afghan women and girls, um, if they're honest, um, can't stand George W. Bush. and. Um, and his phony sentiment, and anybody else that kind of um, says the same thing, they know that they're not. That we don't really care about Afghans. That that is something that we used to sell a product, which was a war, which was run um, for political purposes. So tell me, where we're up to exactly now. Now you've had the proceedings delayed uh, for another year or so. You've got this hanging over your head until the, the kickoff isn't even until another year or something. It's not it? even really kickoff. It's pre-season uh, uh, in the sense that there's a, there's a first, there's an original trial, uh, a, a, a pre-trial about whether or not I'm protected under the uh, public interest disclosure right, which is an act which you would expect, judging by the name, is out there to protect people who do public interest disclosure. And they've already admitted that it was a public interest because they've dropped the, well, They've decided not to continue with the charges against the ABC journalists. And the reason that they gave uh, was because it was a public interest story and they don't prosecute people for public interest stories. Right. Okay, so it's on the record that they know it was a public interest story and you think I'd be protected by the Act. But the Public Interest Disclosure Act is a bit like the Fair Work Act. It seems to be the opposite to what it actually proclaims to be. So first we've got to decide whether or that, I don't know, I'm not actually confident that that act's going to protect me, only because the act is so ridiculous. And it's and not even now we've got this ridiculous Kafka situation where the government has admitted the act is pretty hopeless and needs to be rewritten, but I'm still going to go to trial under the old act. Go figure. You know, taxpayer money, not their money, why not? Um, and... I would rather just go straight to the, the jury trial. It's going to be a jury trial. God knows how they're going to have a, a, a secret, top secret jury trial. I imagine everybody in the jury might be, <laughs> they've all got security clearances. It might be a very uh, a very conservative pool, as you might say. Well, they need to have cons- security clearances. Well, it's all, to, if, if the government, the government are going to be hoist on their own petard to a certain extent. One hand, they're saying this is all super, 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 you know, information. On the other hand, they're going to have to find 12 people who can hear super-duper information um, who don't work for the government. Uh, well, maybe they do. So well, sele- you know, The it, jury selection process would be interesting, <laughs> wouldn't it? It's going to be really... And they're going to, even if they get people from the street, they're going to have to, they're going to, have to give them security classifications. And it's going to make a, a mockery of the idea that the information was that secret. If they're going to pick people out of suburban Camerons, well, it's, the, the security clearance to get to my level takes two years. 
You have to ask all sorts of questions, look at your bank details, find out about your sexual past, every hotel you've spent in. So that's, it's just it's a ridiculous idea. And that, of course, but the government don't want to have to admit that it's really not. The information wasn't really, uh, you know, it, it was about murders, it was about crimes. It's not actually about our secrets, you know. So, so it seems that the government's playing a drag it out type of game. Yeah, I, I, yeah they're and, and as is so often the case with whistleblowers, that they like to make an example yeah. and to create a lot of problems in somebody's life and the, the life of the family and the children yeah, and everybody. Yeah. That sets an example. Don't go blowing the whistle, yeah. just shut up and do yeah. what you, the government wants you to do. Yeah, and we touched on it and they like to think, and this is my message to people who work for the Attorney General's Department and the, and the Australian government, so this is, you know, you are the bad guys. My mother was 92 and she was trying to hang in here for the end of my trial and she would recently passed away last week. She died and there's no doubt that my trial uh, contributed to her death. You know, she was a sick woman and it was it was an extra bit of pre- anxiety and pressure to have her son maybe going to jail for life. So, so do the AGs and you, you are the bad guys. My father died uh, after I, uh, I, was, I was on the run when he died. I wasn't actually charged. I couldn't go to his funeral because I knew I'd get arrested. You know, um, we are, a, we are a, a, a basically a pretty good Australian family. The government would like, uh, uh, they would like to see me commit suicide. Then it's not, a, it, it's not like two, two equally matched sporting teams fighting each other. Uh, they are pretty bad. And if you, you know, if you work for the government on this, they, they, they wouldn't say it out loud, but they would be happy for my children to self-harm, for me to self-harm. They really want to destroy me and they think that that's part of the job. Now, I say it's not. That's not the Australia I grew up in. Well, it's certainly the case with Assange, who's effectively being yeah. tortured by his incarceration, isn't it? So it's part, it's part of the playbook. There's no doubt about it's that. It's part of the playbook. So and they think that it's clever, but it's not great. No, but it's extreme pressure on people. Uh, it certainly seems to be part of the playbook. Now, what about the other proceedings then? What's, what are the other acts that they're... Uh, that they're pursuing you on? Well, there's a whole lot of acts. They're, 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 I, um, I don't read them too much. One thing that's in my favour is it's not, a, it's not a pure official secrets act. And it's not like you, the simple act of giving documents to the ABC is not enough. Or that I, there's a gap in legislation. I'm charged under the Defence Act with uh, an oldie worldy thing which says I, I gave information to people that weren't entitled to it and it wasn't my duty to do so. Now, I love that last phrase because I want to run the case on the idea that it exactly was my duty. I had a practicing certificate as a lawyer. Uh, I was a military officer who went to the military schools where they talk about honour and ethics and uh, moral courage. You're meant to have moral courage. as memory It's one of the sort of touchstones of the Australian Defence Force. And I reckon I did exactly what I was meant to do. Which, which you'll be able to say in court. And yeah, you know, and I want to I have that judged in court. Did he do his duty or did he not? What is, it, what is a, a public servant's duty when they see the wrongdoing? So in a public sense, the, the media coverage of this, I mean, the fact that you went public mm. um, intrepidly gave you positive coverage mm. generally. But how have you seen the media cover it since then, and uh, you've decided to keep it in the public domain rather than keep it lawyer to lawyer because you feel that you've got a better chance of justice or because, you, because you're doing the right thing by talking about these issues publicly? It's always a gamble, and I have, um, I have a lot of argy-bargy with my lawyer, um, who is uh, uh, an ex-newsman, so he, he knows a lot about it. I, my attitude is, and I, I have my fingers burned a few times, but my attitude is I'll speak to anybody, anytime. Uh, that's a bit of a gamble and I've had a bit of beginner's luck. I got set up once uh, by um, in a, uh, a piece in the Sydney Morning Herald and I think the guy had been, he was a defence writer and um, he, he was quite clever and this is what, it was quite a good illustration about a clever hatchet job and that he talked, he said a lot of sort of relatively puffy things about, you know, I'd been to Oxford and I was a box camp, whatever. But he put the boot in a few, a few final paragraphs. Whereas if a judge or someone was reading it, they kind of, 
he, he implied that I was a little bit unbalanced, that I was that I was a little bit, you know, wound up a bit too tight and just did it subtly. Uh, so I got my fingers burnt on that one. Luckily, people don't read things very closely. And even though I was very angry about it, most people were like, good article. And they didn't get to the last five paragraphs. <laughs> you, came, you, know, you came across very well. And um, there was something in there about me biting someone's finger off. And people were going, that's fucking great. But uh, it's interesting how people don't really read stuff. But um, I think it's been helpful. The, the Twitter has been really good for me. The, I, I need to sing your praises because you are – the independent media um, is so powerful and you could easily be the best intentioned person in the world and you could go down the, the drain um, pretty quickly because uh, you want, you, there's, there's no guarantee the mainstream media will help you. Um, and uh, they might, and I haven't been treated particularly badly, but they, uh, it, there's a lot of... We're sensitive to government sensibilities. Well, perhaps. I think that, I, I think... Certain journal, I've been not mentioned the particular papers, but I think certain journalists have a lot of personal sympathy with me. But of course, they are, yeah, they got the government is a huge um, advertiser in the Australian, and 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 they, they don't want to piss the government off. The first time it was covered, uh, I spoke to a journalist in a very positive fashion, and yet the first thing that was covered and all it said was I was charged with theft, famous, you know, lawyer charged with theft. And um, uh, even though we talked about all the major issues, you know, and uh, they have done some very good things for me. They have covered what I – you can't get everything. I mean, there's so many wheels within wheels. The Australian have covered the fact that the, the leadership have got questions to answer, which I like, and I'm very grateful for them doing that because that's my key thing. Um, obviously, the, uh, the nine newspapers are covering um, – uh, the war crimes trial, which I think is re- is really good, and your the substance of your uh, your own work has ended up before the Burton Commission as well. So that's yeah. that's being tested in yeah, another domain. Yeah, that's been good, and that yeah. was covered well. Um, uh, I was happy with that, and I I got good press after Burton came out, and that was very good. I can't certainly can't complain about that. Okay, I, I, my as a lot of people have said to me, it's funny how, and you, we've seen this in the. You would see this in the, in the Trump and Brexit. There is a disconnect between the mainstream media narrative and what a lot of people actually think. And people often say to me, we can't believe Brereton's conclusion that no general knew anything. <laughs> it's just in, in, totally improbable. And so people say that to me, and that's my one complaint about that, is to say we need to look at the leadership. This is not just a problem of a few people at the very bottom. I mean, if it was, putting those people in jail would solve the problem, but they won't. And I'm more worried about the next war than the last war. And if we have shonky people at the top, we're not going to win it. And this is one of the things I say to the Conservatives. Say, the theory of being a Conservative and freedom is all very well, but look at what happened in Afghanistan. I mean, it, it was a failure. It was an absolute $6 billion failure. So if, 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 if your team are that good, we would not have had, had been beaten by a part-time insurgency. Um, and, and this is where I laugh about the, uh, uh, the uh, arms manufacturer lobbyists. If equipment was enough to win a war, we would have won the war. But it, we couldn't even beat the Taliban with all this fancy drones and supersonic jets. And um, so, so, so it's hard so much. Yeah, we need a bit more than that. And we saw mm. it in... Um, uh, one of the things, this is as I was becoming, one of the things I got angry with, there was a very good plane that they used over there. It's, it's, a, it's a Cold War 50s design called the Warthog. Flies slow, got a big cannon on it, and it was perfect for fighting the Taliban. When you're stuck down and they're surrounding you and this slow plane comes in, it's like, and it goes bang, 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 bang. You know you're going to be all right. Anyway, um, they had plenty of them. They could have kept making them, but they phased them out. And the soldiers on the ground said, what are you getting rid of our best weapon for? And they bought in these, the F-35, $6 billion, uh, which wasn't even as good, you know, because it flows, flew so fast. You couldn't just hit the targets on the ground. You have to come back for another one. By that time, everyone was dead, you know. But because Boeing or McDonnell Day, whoever was pushing them in Washington, they were getting the orders for them. I think this is one of the reasons. This is very cynical, but I'm saying that I've, I've talked from an insider who's seen a lot of secret documents. 
I think one of the reasons that they're pushing China and Russia again is they're much more lucrative war markets in that if you're fighting China, you can sell thousands of F-35s and new aircraft carriers. Whatever. The problem with fighting the Islamists is that you couldn't justify, um, you know, new fighter planes and aircraft carriers and... and um, um, and that was a problem. And but the so, reality, of course, is though that fighting is that much you can keep the walls going for a long time. I mean, what would happen if China did actually decide uh, to have a crack at Australia or we did get involved in a war with China? Well, this is the thing, as I say, and I, I really speak to your conservative viewers here. Our team are so rubbish in the sense our leadership, I mean, are, are so idiotic our military leadership, and we would, we would, we couldn't beat Fiji in a war. It's not that we don't have the equipment. Um, we just we don't have anyone with any backbone. Um, we would never tell it like it is. We need people who tell the truth. If things are not going well, we need to say it. I mean, we lost to the Taliban. They weren't that good. We lost to them over twenty years. We need to. And one of the things that is good, we're having a, a Senate inquiry. I hope there's a royal commission. I, I don't care. I can't find out what happened. We, should, we need a Royal Commission in the Defence Force to find out whether they are phony or whether they actually know what they're doing. I mean, I've got, a, I've got a view on that and I'm happy to have a judge look on it, but it's a bit like the banking thing, I suspect. Um, well, there's enough evidence to suggest um, we don't know what we're doing in the defence space and there's a lot of lobbyists and there's a lot of uh, careerists who tell you the right thing, but there are very, anyone that actually tells the truth ends up like me, shunted out. And that's a problem because at the end of the day, we're meant to be defending Australia and everything we believe in for our children and our children's children. And if we're bullshit, we'll not defend them. We need people who actually talk the truth. And it's a, and again, it's an, it's an disgusting development that they're putting people who tell the truth in jail. And again, I, 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 an even worse twist on the one a lot of a lot of things went wrong in Afghanistan. There is one person in Australia who's going to go to jail for Afghanistan, and that's me. The guy that's telling the truth. The guy that told the truth, and they've never proved that I haven't told the truth. Even even the, even my haters say, "Oh, you shouldn't have released a dog." No one's ever said I made them up, printed them in my garage, and, and um, it was all wrong. The real it was real documents, you know. And and how dare you let anyone else read them? My God, if, if the Australian public found out, you know, what we're actually doing, it, it doesn't make sense. People just don't. But psychology is an important thing. A lot of people hate me and say, he broke the rules. He broke the rules. It's like, well, I think the military broke the rules and I think someone needed to stand up and, and uh, be counted. Do you have background silent support from people in the establishment that would be too scared to say anything publicly but would feel that you were doing the right thing? I think so. I think a lot of judicial people. I, th uh, I think people I admire know that it was it was a hard road, and, and I and I did. And a lot of people, frustrated people in the public service, support me because they know the public service has been very politic, completely politicised, mm -hmm. and that the, now they've got the senior executive officers that get huge pay rises for basically doing what the government wants, and not actually do helping Australia. And they're all very frustrated because they know that they have to do it, they'll lose their job. And they I was seen by the last guy in Canberra who didn't get the memo um, that you don't really work for the Australian people, you work for the government. And and that's wrong. But I'm I'm gonna fight that. Uh, so a lot of people support me in that, but people are quite scared. Yeah, I do get whispers to say well, we support you. We um I don't own the Defence Force, it would be they would be in trouble even for having my phone number. Um as such as the sort of witch hunt, but I, uh, I like to think there's a, a lot. What I love is a lot of everyday Australians write to me, you know, farmers and retired cops and things like that, and they say, well, you know, we're, we're great nomads now, we think what you've done is great, here's $10, whatever. I love that. I think the average Australian is a really good person. Yep. Um, what, what has disappointed me? Um, is the intellectuals, I don't think, uh, I don't know that they're doing enough. Anyone that scratches their chin and goes, it's a grey area, um, they don't really help. And I, that's a bit of a, a failure of the, of the private school system. The people who really should be standing up for what is right um, seem to be more interested in counting their job keeper 
millions <laughs> and building a new house in, uh, in uh, Palm Beach or Balmoral, and, and that's a shame. Uh, but the average Australian is, um, is good. They get it um, and they can see whenever you tell your story to someone in the pub or whatever, they, so they say, that sounds fucked. So you tried to do the right thing about war crimes, yeah, and they're trying to put you in jail now, yeah. Um, so um, I, I'm hopeful about, uh, about Australia's future, um, but we need to win this case. And I, I don't see winning the case as um, necessarily being acquitted. It's not about being I could go to jail, but as long as people hear about it and they know about it and they say that guy went to jail for what he believed in and he believed that the government can't break the law and just say it's not a crime because the government does it, that will still be a victory. I will come out of jail a, 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 a bigger man. And I've got teenage children, so it will still be hard. But I'm not afraid of that, if that's what it takes to make Australia the place it should be. Well, thanks very much, David. Um, and for viewers, you can support David uh, at the link below.